Heat Energy Conference. My name is Menno Holsoff. I cover the large cap Canadian and, and some of the U.S. ENPs, and I'll be moderating the five integrated panels this morning. Kicking things off today is Mark Little, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Suncor Energy. By way of background, uh, Mark has been working in the industry for 34 years. I joined Suncor in 2008, took over the reins in the spring of 2019, and has been one of the, the key faces in communicating the oil sand story from an ESG perspective. Mark, can you just um, begin by taking a few minutes to walk us through your key messages to the, to the market? And then I'll take the remainder of the time to drill down on some of the key potential drivers of the story. And, and just as a reminder to those on the line, you can submit uh, questions uh, through the webcast. Uh, the line is yours, Mark. Great. Thanks, Menno, and uh, welcome, everybody. I, I, everybody's really missing out on a big treat in Calgary these days. They're, they're having drive-by pancake breakfast, so you're <laughs> that's a new one. So everybody's getting creative. No, it, it's interesting because we came into this uh, downturn in a strong financial position, and and then through that, and particularly with the high level of uncertainty, we took a, a whole bunch of steps to make sure that the financial health uh, stayed strong through this in, uh, period of time. And so we ended up reducing our capital by $1.9 billion, our operating costs by a $1 billion, and reduced the dividend. And the entire focus of that was to drop the cash break even that we needed from our $45, which we've used for quite some time, a number of years, uh, down to $35 WTI. So, and, and this was really focused around long-term value preservation and making sure that we kept the company strong through this, particularly not knowing when it will all end. We, we think that the integrated model and the connection to the consumer to really understand what's happening with demand is, is still a huge benefit in this, although we know that in the second quarter, this will be the most significant test we've had literally in decades of our overall model. And yet, uh, in saying that, we, we have uh, viewed that the strengths in logistics and the understanding of the, the end consumer and such is, is a very helpful in maximizing value through this period of time. And so that's actually going well. We do think it's going to be a downstream-led recovery, and I, rec <laughs> and I recognize that that's a little bit against the grain when you go to uh, look at what people are saying about the refining circuit globally. Uh, you know, one of the challenges, and, and on the crude side, we, we have a landlocked crude, which sometimes causes issues with logistics and such, being able to get everything out and and uh, working. But, you know, on the flip side, the, it, we're also landlocked on a lot of the product markets within in Alberta and, uh, and within Canada through the prairies and even in Ontario and a little bit in Quebec. So, and, th and that's helpful. So I think you're going to see the Canadian marketplace do a little better than the North American average and such. So, so it, we do think that our model is still very good in keeping the company strong, even though this is a big test. And our philosophy around capital allocation, our shareholder returns and sustainability really haven't changed through this. There's just less money to go around. And so we've dropped the cash break even. Maybe I'll leave it there, Menno. Sure. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. So, so just to touch on your budget, you mentioned you you cut it pretty deep. It's sitting at about three point six to four billion dollars today. Uh, how are you thinking about that in the context of the the current strip and your revised twenty twenty WTI break even price of thirty five dollars uh, per barrel? And and for perspective for those on the line, this budget the midpoint three point eight billion dollars is smaller than in two thousand nine two thousand nine as we exited the the financial crisis on a much a larger production base. So directionally, Mark, where are we most likely to, to see tweaks to the budget, if at all? Yeah, it's, it, there's no question that uh, this is as low as we've seen in a very long period of time, as you point out, with the company being significantly larger. Uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the capital that we got parked was was growth capital associated with it, but we have gone into sustaining capital and parked a few things like some of the sustaining pads for the in-situ side. So if you look at in our investor deck, 
we actually show a slide that shows sustaining capital, and this is somewhere between 2.2 .2 and 2.4 billion dollars, um, which is below what we think is the sustainable range at 2.75 to 3.75 billion dollars. Some of that is just the fact that we felt that cash preservation was super important in this environment. And, uh, and so we took, you know, significant action, although the momentum in the first quarter, we, we ended up spending more in line with our original budget pace. So that means the rest of the year we had to put the brakes on pretty hard. So if, if we stayed at these levels, uh, we could sustain the business going forward. But this is, this is a challenge, uh, particularly with the amount of growth that we'll spend this year. Next year, if we're at $35, WTI will have to scale back on the growth capital further um, and and spend the normal sustaining capital because next year is a big turnaround year for us. And just to to touch on the the dividend, I'm I'm sure you're you're sick of answering this question, but it's an important one. Uh, you cut by 55 percent. In in retrospect. Was that too deep? Like, what what has the feedback been on on your end on that cut? And what are the things that are you're going you're going to be looking for in order to to take that back up over time? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Menno. I mean, as you pointed out, capital is the lowest we've seen in a very long time, and the companies are much larger. We're taking a we we're aggressively going at our operating costs. We did end up taking the cut on the dividend. The whole intent was to get to this $35 WTI break even so that we can keep the company financially strong through this. Our view was is that this is going to be a protracted and prolonged uh, environment and so that this wasn't something that was going to go away in one quarter or two quarters, that this is going to go on for a period of time. It, it, so the crude price is much higher today than what it was when we made this decision, but it's it's still below our $45 that we had before, and there's still a lot of uh, water to go under the bridge, so to speak, about the uncertainty. In crude inventories are still high. Refining margins and refining inventories are high. Demand isn't fully back. For every positive step forward that some economies are taking, some other economies are putting uh, restart programs on hold, if not reimposing uh, guidelines and and uh, constraints to the economy. So, you know, we have a long ways to go to get out of this. We anticipated that. And I think the real question will be two years from now, do we view that we were too conservative or overly aggressive associated with it? Our entire uh, objective was to reset it to $35 and then we would work from how do we move forward and continue to grow the dividend from that uh, from that point forward. Okay, and then just to to move over to to Fort Hills, you you made the decision to draw production to to one train. So maybe you could just give us an update on the current status of activity levels at that project and what the key financial considerations would look like in terms of bringing that uh, second train back online. Yeah, the the. So just in that particular case, it was subject to curtailment within the province of Alberta. The curtailment was calculated when we were starting up the project, so we felt it was disproportionately impacted from the curtailment process. So essentially we can run it at, you know, approximately 75% utilization, uh, 75 to 80% utilization, but it has two trains, so you can run both of them at, 75% or you can run one at 100 and another at 50. What we eventually decided in the price environment was let's work to run one train fully loaded and fully utilized, shut the other one down and try and variableize what normally would be some fixed costs associated with it. When, when we look forward and look at the factors, one, we need you know a long-term price stability. The, the price is actually pretty good right now. I think the price is strong enough that every producer in the world could justify bringing their crude back to market associated with it. But we're also trying to make sure that when we bring the asset back, we can run it in an efficient way. Running an asset uh, well below its utilization and its capability is really tough because your costs go through the roof and 
a, a lot of these are relatively high fixed costs. And then the third thing is really around we're, we're trying to restructure the cost. Like the original plan was let's start this up, let's run it for a period of time. We would have additional resources on site to be able to run this asset at full utilization for a period of time. That actually never happened. We did hit nameplate capacity on the facility, but immediately went into curtailment. And so now what we're trying to do is lean out the organization as if this had operated at full utilization. You know, there's a little bit of risk associated with it, but we're carrying a cost essentially that's, that's over what it needs to be so that when, when we can, we can run this and get back to our $20 to $23 a barrel Canadian uh, operating cost that we originally stated for the project. We think we'll get there. So we're accelerating things like autonomous haul trucks, but we're also reorganizing the site and, and changing the workforce and such on the site, uh, consistent with our original plans, which had all been delayed. And then if we move on to, uh, to line five, it's, it's obviously been in the, the news a ton of late. Can you just walk us through how the most recent developments are affecting the, the Sarnia refinery and what out options you have in terms of sourcing additional sources of feedstock? How long have you been working these angles? And, and more generally, what sort of an impact could a full or a partial shutdown have on refined product fundamentals in Ontario and, and Michigan? Yeah, I, I, that's a, it's a great question and obviously one that's getting a lot of uh, discussion associated with it. There's essentially, we're taking crude through line five to, to feed two of our sites. One is Sarnia and the other is Montreal. And so one of the things that we do is whatever we can get through there, if we think there are constraints, we, we start moving uh, rail or ships to actually produce and uh, provide the crude into Montreal into uh, and so we can we can actually move a lot of crude into the Montreal facility through those those uh, methods we also have access to the Portland main pipeline that was there to bring in waterborne crudes into Montreal as well so when there are constraints in place we would leverage all of that infrastructure and uh, bring different crudes into Montreal if you remember, if you go back far enough, even Ontario refining was provided with waterborne crudes uh, at one point in time when line nine was reversed the other way. So, but but right now, that's our our focus would be around uh, making sure if there are any constraints, and and we do that anytime we think that there is an issue or there's any hiccups in the process. So the refineries, you know, have continued to run at near normal capacities uh, now, and you know, obviously, COVID's had a, a bigger effect on this whole thing, for sure. And and it's interesting because Line f Five is actually feeding the Eastern Canadian refineries as well as Michigan and Ohio, and so it's it's providing a lot of clean product to that critical part of the both of Canada and the U.S. And so by moving crude by rail or ship and such often is more costly. That's why it wouldn't happen if Line 5 is in place. And so, you know, I, I think that this is a, a huge potential threat if, you know, to the extent that it's probable. It's a threat not just to the Canadian product markets in central Canada and Ontario and uh, Quebec, but it is in Michigan as well. So. It, and this is something that would impact consumers in all of those markets. And just sticking with uh, the pipeline theme, uh, Dakota Access obviously made the news in, in the biggest of ways yesterday. And this is this is a question from the webcast. Can, can you just confirm whether or not you have any volumes on on Dakota Access and whether that development is affecting your operations in any way? No, we don't have any volumes on that uh, pipeline. Do, do, do you foresee anything backing up on the back of that? No, no I, I mean, prior to the pipeline, a lot of this crude was moved by rail. So I, I think it's, a, you know, it's a regional logistics issue associated with it. I, and so, you know, what we're expecting is, yeah, there's going to be a logistics issue. Will this 
have an impact on the availability of that crude in the marketplace, maybe it will, but it, certainly during these times, there's more than enough crude to go around. So, you know, certainly for the foreseeable future, we don't see this as a as a impact on us. Okay, and then, then if we move on to your uh, incremental free funds flow target, um, the original target there was $2 billion by 2023, and then that was revised to a billion dollars by 2023, with a second billion dollar tranche expected in 2024, 2025. So, can you just remind us of, of what changed in terms of the funding and the timing of the projects that drive those targets, and, and what you would need to see to potentially reaccelerate them with with higher uh, crude prices? Sure. No, that that's a great question. Originally, when we set this target, like if you go back to 2019, we were just over $10 billion of, of operating cash flow. So this was to grow it by an incremental 20% essentially. And, uh, and as you pointed out, we, our original plan was to have that all delivered by 2023. It, certainly in this environment, we've ended up uh, delaying some of the projects that were required to achieve that. And uh, con consistent with the capital numbers and stuff we just ended up talking about. So there's, there's real focus associated with it, but there's a number of projects that are continuing on. So we're still planning to deliver the $1 billion by 2023. And, and so we're expediting like our autonomous haul truck uh, deployment at Fort Hills as an example, which I was talking about and driving down some of the costs and such. We've, we've maintained some of the technology investments in our supply and trading organization. Uh, we also are finishing the Syncrude Suncor interconnecting pipeline, which we've talked a lot about to add some operating flexibility. So there's a bunch of these projects that are still getting funded under our current capital program. And then there's a number of critical investments that did get delayed, and that's really the coke-fired boilers at base plant and like the wind farm that we had uh, started in the fall. And so that's part of the $1.9 billion reduction we took in capital this year. So that, that's actually what's pushed it out. The cogen is the first project we want to restart. There's no question about that because there's so many great facets associated with it. But the, so anyway, so that's what we've been working on to make sure that we can continue to drive that down. And then if it turns out that the environment is healthier and stable going forward and we're generating more cash than our $35, you know, some of that would go to the balance sheet, some of it would go to these projects, and, and some of it would go to shareholder returns. And because you touched on it, uh, we'll move to the to the balance sheet with with the last two minutes. I can't believe it's over already. Uh, you exited uh, Q1 at the top end of your targeted uh, total debt to cap range of 20 to 35 percent. So maybe you could just give us a refresh on your overall thoughts on leverage, liquidity, the balance sheet schedule, and um, and you touched on this a little bit as well. But uh, what what is the first call on capital when we exit this downturn and free cash flow generation becomes a bigger part of the story again. Yeah, I, I mean, part of the whole focus of this was keeping the company strong through this whole process. And so we've done, we've actually increased our capacity with two debt placements. So one was $1.25 billion Canadian and the other was a billion dollars US. And uh, and so we're just wanting to make sure that we have lots of liquidity. We we do have a debt maturity in 2021 of 1.4 billion dollars, and in 2022, 300 million dollars. And and we now feel that we have all of the financing and such done to be able to pay out and deal with those maturities, so that we don't have any uh, challenges and such that we might have to the balance sheet. So we will look to try and bring our our debt to cap back to the thirty back in the thirty five percent range, which was the high end of the range that we had before, and and so as I mentioned before, is if it turns out as we position the company, if we're generating incremental cash above the thirty five dollar WTI, uh, the the deal was is we're allocating that between the growth capital, the shareholder returns, and the balance sheet, and and making sure that we're dealing with all of those, all of which have been impacted through this environment. So, and, and maybe, Menno, I know our time's kind of come and gone here, but 
the, the one other thing that we've said through this is, although we've made a bunch of changes and such, certainly our positioning on ESG, I thought it was important coming into this. We've obviously had sustainability reports for the last two decades. Um, but we think it'll even be more important coming out of this. And as one of two democratic nations that's a large producer in the world, uh, we think Canada is a great champion to be able to move forward on that. So I guess our time's up. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, because we could, we could keep this going for a lot longer. But um, as always, I appreciate your time.